So I want to do a very short standalone clip in response to something that Daniel Schmachtenberger was sharing in the uh, War on Sense Making Pieces, which were all about how the information ecology is damaged and what we need to start doing about that, how we might start getting a more healthy information ecology. And I've been thinking about some of the, like Rule Omega being one of those things, like giving, giving someone the benefit of the doubt and hoping that uh, by doing that, we can start to tease out the meaning and then we go enter a sort of intersubjective sense-making process together that's more than the sum of its parts. And I was thinking about whether there's a rule omega for interpersonal dialogue. And I was also thinking about how, like, in my personal life, I've kind of evolved towards a rule of um, not to say, and it's, this is about gossip as well, and there's a really interesting question about kind of what the value of, like, you could call it gossip or talking about other people plays. There's a, there's a lot of thought about that, that it's actually quite a, it's a really valuable thing for communities to do because it helps police uh, or enforce boundaries in terms of our interactions with each other, knowing how people have treated others in the past. And that's a really interesting kind of area. I think um, the Sapiens guy uh, writes about gossip in that way, how it's a really, really important thing. Um, Yuval Noah Harari. Mm -hmm. And so my kind of nascent rule omega is I try, if I have something that I will say about someone, I will make sure that I've said that to that person. Like I don't feel comfortable saying something about someone that I haven't actually said to their face. Um, and that's something that I've kind of evolved towards of like what feels right for me in terms of when I realize I'm talking about someone behind their back or whatever. It's like I feel comfortable saying something as long as they're aware of that. I've had that conversation with them and then given them a chance to respond, made it clear what my position is. If you imagine that as a kind of rule omega, rule, I don't know, rule delta or something like that for interpersonal relations, it does feel like that starts to tidy up the information ecology because you know when you're expressing something, if, if you're all behave, kind of agreeing to that rule, you know that anything that you've heard has been expressed to that person. It like clears out, starts to clear out a lot of the um, he said, she said, we said, but you're not supposed to know this or whatever. And also I think that's part of, that's part of being more centered, being more honest, being like more grounded in, in our lives when we're not having to keep track of who knows something and who knows something else and then which story we've told to this person and if we're allowed to share it with that person. It's like that is a huge weight of storylines for us to keep in our minds at all times and it's really exhausting and, and really so stops us being really present in our lives. It's a lot easier as Jordan Peterson talks about, if you, if you orient towards truth, it makes things a lot easier in our lives because there's a lot of stuff you don't have to keep remembering all the time. But then, as Daniel explained in the second um, War on Sense Making, almost anything can be weaponized. And I want to go into some of the exceptions on that as well. But when I was, when I was following this sort of this thought pattern of, okay, that could be a, a rule omega for interpersonal dialogue, if you know that you're talking about someone, it's like, and it's also something we can then kind of enforce with each other. If you hear someone saying to you, oh, well, this person did that, or they're, they're, they're like this, you can say, well, actually, have you, have you shared that with them? Like, I find myself doing that more and more. It's like, well, if you're telling me this, have you had that conversation with that person? And then asking that person to maybe, if you're gonna share that with me, you should really let them know, you should have that conversation. And I wanna go into kind of the exceptions, because there's always exceptions to this rule. But I was really struck when I kind of followed this, this, this kind of train of thought that that's also a rule that's kind of evolved as one of the cardinal rules of journalism. It's called right of reply, that you learn very early. It's like if you have any uh, comment or, um, or claim about anyone in an article, one of the rules, you have to put it to the person or the corporation or the, the individual or whatever before you publish it. So you have to get the right of reply and you have to put that into your article, which feels really fair. Like it, and it's interesting that that's evolved as kind of naturally over time as a, as a rule of within journalism, which is, which is part of the information ecology. There's another thing that came out of the war of sense making too, so that Daniel Schmachtenberger said, which then it kind of hit home for me after I heard a phrase just randomly, which was emotions are not instructions. I thought, huh, it's really interesting because I'm a mindfulness uh, instructor as well, but I also do you know, the kind of work we do as, as counselors and the inner growth work is very much around what am I feeling right now and bringing that out. But as Daniel pointed out, everything can be weaponized. So emotions can be weaponized and emotions, emotions are very complex. I think in terms of like a, a principle or rule for interrelating, 
emotions are not instructions is a really nice phrase because the person I heard it from described it as they're really important. You need to listen to your emotions. You need to be absolutely connected with what they are, you know, have some objectivity of, you know, being able to say, okay, I'm feeling angry, I'm feeling whatever it might be. But they're not instructions in the sense of you don't have to then react to them. And that's really a core tenet in, in mindful self-awareness is that it comes up, you observe it, and then you decide what to do. That is absolutely crucial. That, that's called decentering. That's part of decentering where I can take that step back. That's crucial for interpersonal dialogue because otherwise emotion could be weaponized in pretty much every sentence. Like, well, I'm feeling like this and you're not acknowledging it. And therefore, I'm, I have a right to get angry at you, or I have a right to do this, or I have a right to do that. So, yeah, so that's a tenant I've really been uh, thinking of and realizing that, that it's been quite core to, uh, to my own practice. And, you know, it's big in stoicism as well. You know, so it's, it's, a, it's a very important skill that we develop. Yeah, but I want to talk a little bit about some of the exceptions. Even that rule can be weaponized. Like, I'm, I'm aware in myself there's been a couple of times where I've shared something with someone or I've had a confrontation with someone and there's a part of me that's like, oh great, now I can, and now I can talk about that person to anyone and I can say this to anyone. Like there is a kind of, like being really aware of how we're using that rule still has to come in. So I, I can think of a couple of times where there's been a sort of mischievous part of myself or kind of vindictive part of myself that's like, right, now I've told that person, now I can say whatever I want about them. So that's, you, you, you can't bypass any of those kind of weaponizations with that rule. And there's also the, the danger of, are you sharing, there's also a kind of meta rule that all of this rests within is there has to be an understanding of when you're sharing that information with someone, are they going to use that information for the benefit of everyone involved? So we're part of various communities that have done, we did counseling training with groups of people, we've, we've got these kind of relationships with people where we're having these kind of conversations and we're asking for reflections from others about our, our kind of negative patterns and what we, kind of what they're observing. And they're really useful and very oriented towards growth. They're really helpful to have those relationships. But if you're sharing stuff about other people and they haven't bought into, like they're still gonna maybe, there's part of them that's motivated by resentment or vindictiveness or some kind of wanting to get one up on the other person. There are certain people that it's not safe to have that kind of relationship with. And have, knowing where that is, and, kind of, and, and the most sort of obvious examples are like the sort of, what you might call the personality disorder spectrum where someone's got such a fragile sense of self that they will kind of weaponize and manipulate and, and like that's the extreme, but there's also, there's probably a cutoff point where what, what differentiates healthy, healthy feedback, healthy gossip from unhealthy gossip. There's a dividing line and it's somewhere in the place of, is that person trustable not to act out in that way? Yeah, it is interesting. As you're talking, what I'm thinking of is the fact that this idea that anything, anything can be weaponized and also how often I see in myself and in various communities how models are used to principles, models, rules of engagement, even something like Rule Omega, whatever it might be, are used to bypass being human. You know, so these things all get tested on the battlefield, so to speak. They get tested in life. And for me, the only thing that's worth is salt is, is our actions, you know, so it comes down to very human values of, you know, what's, how much integrity have I got? How, um, you know, how honest am I? How, you know, how open am I? You know, how can I admit making a mistake, etc.? And so I always find it very interesting to see people under pressure or in challenge. And that's how I test my own values. It's like, okay, well, how are you when money's on the line? You know, that brings up a whole lot of shadows for people. It's like, oh, and so suddenly everything can fall out the window, all these lofty goals. And so that's the bit where I think the real practice happens. And I think that's, you know, we've talked about this concept of coherence and falling out of coherence. I actually think it's when we fall out of coherence that we learn the most in a lot of ways. And so being able to come back into some kind of sovereignty and centeredness and go, oh, I really lost my shit there. I wonder what that was about. Like, that's the important thing. It's not never losing our shit because that's going to happen and that's part of growth. Yeah, and that reminds me of something Daniel said, I think in the first War on Sensemaking, about he trusts people to the level of their worst behavior. Like knowing that, assuming that everything goes pear-shaped, what, how, how bad will you allow it to get? How vindictive will you allow yourself to be? How, and, and that's a really interesting, that's a really good frame, I think, to kind of look at this through. Um, so this has been a lot of fun. We should, we should do more of these. Um, 
yeah, I'm really interested to hear people's thoughts, reflections on this, uh, particularly Daniel. Uh, do you think that this is potentially workable as a rule delta? And if not, which 17 things have we not taken into account? <laughs> um, cool, speak soon. Well done for making it to the end. Just wanted to let you know a few things we've got coming up, including the biggest event we've ever done, the Rebel Wisdom Festival, which will be a mix of ideas and dialogues between people like Daniel Schmachtenberger, Benita Roy, Rupert Sheldrake, John Bavaki, and many more. And because wisdom isn't just intellectual, it's also about practice, we'll be offering experiences like circling, different interpersonal dialogue, mindfulness, breath work, and many other with world-class facilitators. We're also running our first online course called Sensemaking 101. And if you're enjoying the content, you can help us make more by joining the Rebel Wisdom Club, which will give you discounts on the courses and the events, and also access to a load more content on the website, including all of our live events. It'll also give you access to our growing community, which is something we want to make a real focus for 2020, adding more meetups and other services for members. So hope you enjoyed the film and see you soon.